I've always been super inspired by NASA's planned mission to send the rover and this little lander with a rocket inside to collect all of the samples that uh, Perseverance has gathered over the years on Mars and send them back to Earth. Though this may or may not be happening still because, well, the mission cost ran up to like $11 billion, which is like half of NASA's annual budget. So it ain't looking so good. But you know what doesn't have an annual budget? KSP2. Hey, I'm Sweeney Chad, and welcome to a very special episode of KSP2 Aircraft Only. We're going to be gathering samples on Duna and hopefully sending them all the way back to Kerbin in one piece. Here's a rover that's going to be doing it. This is the old design that I shelved a long time ago because I deemed it not aircrafty enough for the series, but we're bringing it back just for this one time. And of course, it is going to be launched by an aircraft. That's what we're getting it prepared for here. And we're also going to be building a little relay because I was very worried about it getting signal on Duna with just the antenna that it had on board. Um, you don't really need a relay antenna anymore in KSP2. Any antenna works, but I decided to go with one of the relay antennas just for looks, basically. And we're going to pack everything into this little cargo bay, put a super efficient engine there on the back, and uh, then put it on one of our SSTOs, the one that we used to launch the Minmus stuff in one of the last videos, since this, this is like our star SSTO right now. This thing can get pretty much anything of any size and shape into orbit if we need it to. <laughs> and right on cue, we're lighting those massive rocket engines that this thing has. Uh, they're kind of overpowered in the current setup. Uh, I think I could definitely squeeze a lot more payload out of this if I really tried to optimize it. Right now it's like 45, 50 tons to uh, low urban orbit. But I think I could definitely get a lot more out of it if we optimize it in the future. So to keep an eye out for that. We did run out of power with our payload though and had a bit of a panic attack. Luckily the rover had some backup solar panels that saved us and let me deploy the real ones. So luckily that crisis was averted without reverting the flight completely. And now all that's left to do is transfer out to Duna. Now we did get a perfect transfer but it doesn't really matter. Ideally you would want the, uh, the encounter with Duna to be exactly at your apoapsis. That would be the lowest delta V capture possible. But it doesn't really matter that we got it kind of off on this because we've got a lot of delta V to spare thanks to that gigantic engine in the back. It's one of those expanding extendable bell engines that was added in one of the first part updates for a KSP2 and uh, it gives us plenty of Delta V. And let's just take a moment to appreciate how beautiful Duna is as we approach it here. Uh, admittedly, it does look a lot like Mars, but you know, Mars is a beautiful planet and they did a good job making Duna look really, really nice. And since we aren't so worried about Delta V in this mission, we aren't gonna be doing any kind of aero braking. We will be doing a regular just capture burn, but we're gonna be doing a uh, gravity assist around Ike to put us in a polar orbit. And of course, we're gonna be visiting Ike anyway just to get as much science as possible. So we might as well just drop by drop our little relay off at Ike and then uh, continue on our merry way to our landing spot on the North Pole of Duna, which we've landed very close to before with the Monument mission. It's almost at the North Polar region, but uh, we're going to be landing at the North Pole just because it's got such a high bio density there in such a short span of uh, uh, distance. We won't have to rove that far to find new biomes, though I may or may have not underestimated how far apart things are on Duna. I may have thought of it as a little bit smaller than it actually is. <laughs> but here we are heading out to uh, to Ak, and we're going to be dropping off our little relay here. It's a little relay slash uh, just satellite to keep around Ak, just so we have something orbiting uh, there for future use if we need it. There is a mission here at Ak that we're going to be returning eventually for because I want to go full mission completion in this series. And uh, it's sending uh, three curvals to the surface of Ak and back. There's our relay, which uh, I spent probably too much effort making look nice. I really like the way it turned out. We're gonna get some measurements from Ak and everything and send those back using the uh, relay. And then we're gonna send this back to Duna. Now we are gonna be doing some aero braking with, uh, with this thing. I didn't really trust it for the full interplanetary aero braking, but uh, it can handle uh, Duna orbital velocities, which compared to like Kerbin is extremely, extremely low, like 1100, 1200 meters per second. And it's a super thin atmosphere, so uh, no problem slowing down with that. And just to help us along, you may notice that I opened up the payload bay doors to act as two giant air brakes. And this is very Starship-like. It's, it's very, very Starship-like. This is the way that Starship more or less would slow down there, except it would be using its elaterons and uh, its belly side to uh, slow down. So we're kind of like a giant, weird, Starshipy satellite bus thing. Kind of. Sort of. Whatever we are, we're in a nice circular orbit around Duna now, and we're going to bring it down to our landing spot near the North Pole, which is going to be right around here. And originally the plan was, was to land here, get all the North Pole bombs, and then work our way gradually all the way down to the equator to an Easter egg, then launch from the equator, 
and use the planet's rotation to help us out and save a little bit of Delta V. But much like NASA's sample return mission from Mars, uh, we're going to have to do a, a little bit of a reevaluating with that one. <laughs> So anyway, we're releasing our rover now, and uh, it's going to kind of phase through the inside of the cargo bay here. We're using uh, some uh, KSP uh, time warp magic to get it out of there because uh, it was just kind of hung on the decoupler and stuff and just did not want to come out. So uh, anyway, we're going to tilt it around here, and it actually has two little uh, it has two little engines in it that can uh, just barely get it deorbited and then hopefully give it a little bit of an extra uh, cushioning effect whenever we do land it. Uh, I was trying to keep drag to a minimum because it kind of undershot our landing spot, so that's why I pulled up the drag UI there. We got as much science on the way down as we possibly could, and oh my god, this is so cursed. Just a rover falling to its doom over top of Duna. <laughs> pretty funny but anyway we activate our four full-size parachutes here and Duna of course has a very thin atmosphere so uh, it's fairly hard for even this to slow it down to a safe speed we got down to a somewhat safe speed of like 14 meters per second then activated our cushioning engines there which didn't really do much but we bounced and didn't break anything and so as long as everything's salvageable I'm okay with it luckily this thing has some really beefy reaction wheels in it because it's two rover bodies stuck together uh, so we were able to flip it back over and then warp to daylight and finally get to deploying our whole uh, solar panels but I did accidentally leave my blinker on apparently no idea what was causing that uh, blink was not on on that lot Anyway, we deploy our solar panels, which are uh, non-retractable. We those will be out the entire mission now, like little wings flying around with us, and we start doing some science. And it turns out this little sample grabber part, which is uh, new to the KSP uh, two science update, it's not like a reused part. It actually grabs little samples in there, and you can see it fill it up with the dirt. We got some uh, a pretty darn good amount of science from those samples, and then we're going to head up north to the next bomb because we missed the North Pole by a bit here's our starting position right now and we're going to need to work our way all the way up to uh, the po uh, the highlands biome and then the polar desert and then the north pole biome i believe that's all of them um and then work our way back through this route that was the planned route at least to work our way back but uh turns out high speed roving is a little bit dangerous and it wasn't so high speed for me. I'll add in a little clip of a uh, real speed right here. You'll notice it when the frame rate drops to like nothing right here. Um, this was the actual speed that I was roving around at, even at 3x time warp. So it was uh, it was pretty bad. So we're going to speed it up for you though to like 100 times speed. Uh, so you can get this nice little uh, roving compilation here. Um, super duper speed roving compilation. Sorry for the camera jumping around. I was playing at a very slow speed and I'm speeding up to a very high speed so the camera gets a, gets a bit wild. Uh, so here we are at the top of this little mountain and I decided to stop and see how far we had came. And yeah, we, we barely made it anywhere. This was when I realized that we might not be able to backtrack all the way back to the equator and the Easter egg I wanted to visit. Yeah, bit a tad bit depressing, just a tad bit depressing, but uh, we'll make it work. We'll at least get those bombs and uh, we'll flip down the side of a mountain while we're at it. And as the rule goes, as long as nothing breaks, we're going to keep it. So we flip over and keep on our merry way. <laughs> You've probably seen like a little tiny single frame there of when I checked to make sure nothing broke. Always pull up your flight report. Uh, to make sure nothing broke. <laughs> the last thing you want is get really deep into a mission and then find out some critical part that you needed to complete it broke and you didn't know about it. I wouldn't know about that at all. I tried pushing the speed a little bit farther to make things a tad bit more bearable for me, but as you can see, that didn't exactly work out for me. Uh, but we did push it uh, pretty, pretty far. I think like it got up to like 20 meters per second or something, but it was only a short burst and when we came to terrain like this, I need to really slow down. I decided it was time to check our progress here because we hadn't still we still hadn't even gotten to another biome yet, and uh, we'd made it pretty darn far in a fairly short amount of time, probably about two hours in game, an hour or two in game, somewhere around there. Pretty good when you consider I was playing it like six FPS. And right around here, we finally crossed into a new biome. Uh, it was the the almost said lunar highlands, the highlands biome, the Duna highlands biome. We came up to this rock hoping that uh, the sample arm would grab from it, but uh, yeah, it was just getting dirt from the ground again. I love how those little capsules fill up. I kept, I had to keep zooming in on it just to show you how cool that is. It fills up the little sample capsules. It's so cool. But um. We continue, and the terrain gets a lot worse, as you can tell, and we're only crawling along it pretty much 
constantly under 10 meters per second. So really, really crawling alone. But finally, we cross into the polar desert uh, biome and get some new samples from there. Meaning that we only have like one biome left before, uh, well, we've got every biome in this area. And pretty much every biome that we can get on the whole mission, for the most part. I'm going to zoom in here and kind of plan out my trip to the uh, to the North Pole. We're going to try to follow this canyon and try to get one of those little icy spots and hope that it's the North Pole biome. So we endeavor to persevere and carry on our little mission across the uh, North Pole here as things get darker and darker for us and the terrain gets more rough and more rough. But gradually, as we crawl along at some completely random point, we cross into the North Pole Biome. No idea how this counts as the North Pole Biome, given that it's really no different than like 10 feet away from it where it wasn't North Pole Biome, but I'll take it. You can see there's like some little ice chunks that started in the polar desert though. Just random ice chunks everywhere. We got a fair bit of science now though. A lot more than I was actually expecting given we'd already visited Duna and everything. But we're going to find a nice little spot and just go ahead and send our rocket back home. Because we're on like hour five of roving around here at this point, And there's no way I'm making it back to the equator. So it's time to kick this rocket off of the rover's back and use this nifty little thing that I came up with. We have no robotic parts in KSP2. We may never get robotic parts in KSP2, but we do have air brakes. And you can use them like this. So instead of standing it up with a hinge or something, we're using air brakes and a little bit of help from the reaction wheels in the rocket. This is a three-stage rocket. It has uh, two methylox stages uh, to get it into orbit and then an orbital ion stage, which gives us way, way more delta V than we actually need. We're going to get the rover safely away from this whole situation because we can reuse this in the future and rove around on Duna if we so wish. Here's some nice shots of the rocket taking off in the background from the rover's POV. And now it's time to get this thing into Duna orbit. Now this in testing a long time ago cut it very very close delta v wise on actually getting to orbit and obviously the ion engine which are even weaker than they were in ksp1 from what my understanding uh isn't going to be able to help us get this into orbit so we need to rely on these two methylox stages which uh just barely get us there and we're in a pretty much exactly polar orbit whenever we do finally get into orbit so no help from the planet's per rotation none of that crap I guess this is just a result of me like always adding a little bit more extra delta V into whatever I'm building because uh, it's always better to uh, go with more than to go with less. So we've got our solar panels out and we do some last minute science return and stuff to uh, Kerbin and uh, use up the last bit of uh, fuel in our last methylox stage and then go fully to our ion stage. Now all that's left, the last stage on this rocket, is the actual return capsule and everything. So we've just got a whole bunch of Delta V in the ion stage and a return capsule. You'll notice while we're pushing our orbit out to leave Duna that it's very, very slow. And that's for two reasons. The ion engines are incredibly slow. I mean, in real life, you spend days burning with them. Um, but also because we weren't really running the ion engine at full power. It was running kind of like in a pulse sort of way as you can see, because we didn't have enough power to run it. But it's just enough to uh, function and just barely get our spacecraft along. So here we are heading back to Kerbin. We just forced an encounter, or more or less an impact with Kerbin. And for some reason, as we approached Kerbin, it turned white. Looks something like me scattering or something like that going on, but uh, a snowball Kerbin looks pretty cool, actually. I guess we caused him major ice age with all of the uh, uh, aircraft launches and everything, especially that newest SSTO and all the pollution it puts out. <laughs> so here we're just going to try to slow down as much as we can. This was actually a slightly dumb idea because we almost ran out of electricity in our last little stage or last little uh, return capsule that you'll see disconnect in a bit. And that has no way of powering itself or uh, making any new power, so it has to rely on what power it has to get down to the surface of Kerbin. And as you can see, we're absolutely burning up in the atmosphere. Solar panels are so OP now, apparently. They take so long to uh, burn up in the atmosphere. As you can see, just to, it took this long for those solar panels to pop off. I feel like in the first game, they were the, always the first thing to go, which I guess is still true, but uh, still, it seems like, like they shouldn't be surviving any of that. But here we disconnect our little return capsule, and oh my god, look at the plasma around that. The, the streak is like 10 times the length of the little capsule itself. The capsule being one of those like a 6.25 meter uh, heat shields, a little tiny probe core, and a gigantic parachute that's acted as our nose cone so far. And what I mean that, that 
parachute's gigantic. This is the same parachute that you would use to bring back a uh, classic Mark I capsule with a jeb inside, but it's for this little tiny little probe core and a heat shield, so it's, uh, it's a little bit OP. So it comes down very, very slowly, but I didn't think about whether or not this would actually float in the ocean when it landed. And you would think, well, the parachute will slow it down, but, uh, yeah, the parachute didn't slow it down either. It just stayed deployed since we were sinking so fast and, uh, didn't even slow it down in the water. Apparently, parachutes don't work in water. So we reloaded the game, the parachute disappeared, but then we couldn't see anything. Um, but then I found out that you can just recover it anyway, even though it's still moving, apparently. So we got all of our parts and everything back, not that that matters, but we got our science, 4,000 science, not an insane amount, but very respectable given this was just a revisit to a planet that we'd already been to. But we almost forgot about our SSTO, which has been in orbit this entire time, and we gotta bring it back down to the KSC naturally. Now I've gotten pretty good at bringing this specific SSTO down to the uh, runway, so, and you've probably seen it a million times if you watch one of my last videos where I made this one, uh, so I just get this down to the ground as quickly and as not efficiently whatsoever, not nicely whatsoever, as Ryan air as I possibly could but it wasn't too awfully bad as far as landings go. So we recover everything and we're ready for our next mission. And what a mission it will be. Here's the thumbnail from the next video. Let me know if you can tell what we're about to do. It's gonna be really long and really insane. But that's all I've got for today. Smoonie Chad, out.